We're not out there fighting anything other than crime. We see stuff that nobody should have to Put see. Put your back! Hands it back! Hands it back! Get out of it, no. Get out! Get out! Don't move! Oh, don't move! Torch 31, erect out! You're listening to The Beat, profiles of police nationwide. Being a Connecticut guy, it's about time I got, well, a Connecticut guy on for The Beat. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to the Mike Haven podcast, volume 11 of that miniseries tonight. Uh, but good to see everybody on this Friday night, of course, if you're watching via YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter, if you haven't checked out the previous two episodes, good ones as always. Uh, for the best of the bravest FDNY miniseries, we had a former FDNY chief of operations, Rich Bladis, on, and that was a lot of fun. He finished up as acting chief of operations, which I believe on the uniform side is about the number two in the FDNY. So good conversation with him. 42 year career for him. We went from that to the E men inside the NYPD's emergency service unit, who, by the way, had a great rescue. Shout out to them in the East River the other day of somebody who got stuck. Uh, and that was with Daryl Summers, who was originally in the old New York City Transit Police and their rescue unit. When they merged with the NYPD in 95, he went over to ESU, finished up there in 05. And he was a great guy to talk to as well. We have a really cool guest on tonight who I have a personal connection to, which is nice. And I'll introduce him momentarily. But just a shout out to everybody on the YouTube side who I see early on. William Cooney, Joe Maliga, Don Gonzalez uh, and Billy Ryan of the Ryan Investigative Group, of course, retired NYPD detective. And one of our sponsors will just run through them quickly so we can get our guest in here quickly. And the first one before we get to Billy is, of course, my consulting company. Need advice on how to start your podcast? Frustrated with the editing process? Can't find a voiceover guy? Hi, I'm Mike Cologne, and I'm here to help. I'm the owner and founder of MC Media Editing Services, your premier consulting company for all things media, where I can offer you consulting advice on how to get started. And once you get started, editing as well as voiceover work, all for a very reasonable price. If you want to reach me, you can contact me at 917-781-6189 or the email that you see listed here. I'm always available and I'm always willing to help. Again, 917-781-6189. Why go to some giant consulting firm that's going to charge you an arm and a leg when you can just come to me? If you want to be stress-free, the way to go is to call MC. MC Media Editing Services, your premier consulting company. Before I get to Billy Ryan, John Costello, retired hostage negotiator and sergeant out of Pennsylvania, just tuned in. Hi, John. Always good to see you. And yes, now, of course, if you need a PI, former NYPD detective Bill Ryan is your man. The Mike the New Haven podcast is proudly sponsored and supported by the Ryan Investigative Group. If you need an elite PI, look no further than the elite Ryan Investigative Group, which is run by retired NYPD detective Bill Ryan, a 20-year veteran of the department who served the majority of his career in the detective bureau, most notably in the arson and explosion squad. So if you need a PI to handle anything from fraud, legal services, and anything else that you might require, contact Bill at 347-417-1610. Again, 347-417-1610. Reach him at his website or the email that you see here. Again, if you need a PI, look no further than Bill Ryan and the Ryan Investigative Group, a proud supporter and sponsor of the Mike to New Haven Podcast. Proud supporter and sponsor indeed. And of course, the Super Chat is there if you want to contribute a question throughout the course of the show. Uh, please feel free to include it in there as always. All right. My next guest for 33 years played an active role as a police officer and later supervisor across two departments from narcotics to tactical operations and plenty more. His career was quite a full plate of everything from mayhem, fun, and just about everything you can think of in between. Uh, he served in the Bridgeport, Connecticut Police Department for 24 years where he finished up as lieutenant and then chief of the Holyoke, Massachusetts Police Department for a number of years. He's an author as well, and his book, No Black Heroes, is one of my favorite reads. I got to pick it up during COVID, and I could not put it down. And uh, that is a friend of the family who I welcome tonight to the Mike New Haven podcast, retired Holyoke Police Chief and former Bridgeport Police Connecticut, that is, uh, Police Lieutenant, that is, Ron Bailey. Ron, welcome. How are you? Hi, how you doing? That's yeah, good to have you. Long time coming. Uh, I reached out to mom because, of course, uh, you go way back with our family, as I said. And I said, do you think he'd want to do the show? And thankfully for me, you said yes, because after reading your book, as we were talking about off the air, I'm like, I would love to profile him on the podcast. And so here you are. But before we dive into everything pertaining to your career, which, as I said, was quite a full plate of different things. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the city of Bridgeport in the housing project. I started in Father Panic. Uh, my mother was not having that. We were there for about a year and she got tired of putting me in the tub to keep me safe because there were shootings there every night. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, we ended up moving to Green's apartments, and uh, I stayed there uh, until I moved out on my own. So there's always an interest early on. Guys get bit by the civil service bug, rather be on the fire side or the police side early on. Other guys come into it later on, maybe when they're teenagers and they don't have a career path yet, someone recommends one and they go down that path. Where would you say, even if you didn't quite know you wanted to be a cop yet, unless you always knew, where would you say the early interest in the idea of civil service began for you? I really did not want to be a police officer. I couldn't stand the police. Mm. I'm embarrassed to say that, but here's why. When I was a kid, in Green's apartments, I took a shortcut behind the police department to go downtown because I was playing in the band at the time. And a police officer there beat me up, beat me up bad for nothing. And years rolled around later on, there was an officer by the name of Ted Meekins. He saw me walking in the mall downtown Bridgeport and he said, young brother, young brother, come here. I was walking to get away from him because I didn't want nothing to do with the police. He kept after me. I finally slowed down and froze up a little bit because I figured, okay, here comes another beating for nothing. What did I do now? He put his hand on my shoulder and says, young brother, I want to talk to you about being a police officer. I was in shock. I was in shock. He would not take no for an answer. He was one of those persistent people that was just like, you got to be a police officer. I finally felt so comfortable with him. I finally told him why I didn't want to be a police officer. And this is what he said to me. He said, young brother, Who better than you to be a police officer? You won't let what happened to you happen to no one else. Mm -hmm. How right he was. He convinced me to take the test. He talked me through the process. He said he would be there when I took the test. He came there to oversee the the applicants that were taking the test. He kept his word. And next thing you know, I'm a police officer. That's how it happened. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that in No Black Heroes, and we'll put the link later on in the description of this episode for those of you that want to buy that book. Like I said, it's a must read. So coming on during the 80s, I mean, certain cities, Mm because this was a unique time, it's right before the crack era started. So certain cities across the country were really feeling the brunt of that. Other cities, not quite. For those not familiar with the makeup of Bridgeport, Connecticut, give us the makeup at that time, how big the city is, and of course, the process of going through the academy. The city of Bridgeport was considered the uh, the little apple compared to New York. We were a project city. We had Father Panic, P.T. Barnum, Evergreens, Marina Villas, Marina Apartments, Trumbull Gardens. I, I could go on and on and on. It was a complete city of housing projects. So crime at that time was pretty rampant in the city. Crack cocaine hadn't come in yet. Uh, uh, it was on its way. When I got on, I got on in 1983, uh, I went through the training process. When you, you train to be a police officer in the city of Bridgeport at that time, you spent six months in the academy. They gave you everything from soup to nuts on what you needed to do to be a police officer. You had to go through dry runs, um, a lot of different things to become a police officer. Once you become a police officer, you ride with an experienced officer for another six months to a year. I forgot how, the time frame. It was a lot short compared to how it is now. But uh, we'll just say it was about another six months. After that, you're out on your own. The first place they put me was in the projects because I was from the projects. I knew the projects. I mean, when I played in the band, most of the people that I entertained when I was younger, they knew me. They were shocked to see me like, Bayless, yo, what's up, dude? You know, one of those type of things. And um, the rest was history. We spent a lot of time in the projects, I can tell you that much, because crime was brought from out of Bridgeport, into Bridgeport by other cities, New York especially. We had many people from New York coming into the projects to take over. Each project was a gym. So everybody wanted a piece of the rock. Yeah, that's a good point because the train line runs right through the city. Absolutely. So you got Metro North stops coming in. I see it all the time on my way down to the city for various things. You know, it's a good point. You got a lot of people coming up from the city. Unfortunately, they caused some trouble. And that's on top of the characters you already have in the city itself who are from there. And you mentioned that in your book as well. Now, of course, it's an advantage to know the streets having grown up in them. But now you're thinking tactically and you're probably thinking tactically to a degree as a civilian to avoid trouble. But it's different as a police officer because you're thinking tactically on how to confront it. You knew a lot of people in there. But now that you're wearing the badge, there's still some people that want to test you. Tell me about trying to walk that beat in a different light now as a cop and the officers early on who you would say most taught you. The three officers that taught me was Tony Brown, Frank Jimmy, and Mike Rodriguez. So I had one black officer, one white officer, and one Latino officer. So I had a really good mix. And these guys were legends from the East End. 
They knew everybody, they knew everything. The person that was most effective with getting me started in doing narcotics work from a patrol car was Tony Brown. Big black officer, about 6'2". Uh, he's in, he's in my, my book. Uh, you got, he's in there helping me arrest someone. He's the one with the cigarette in his mouth. He never <laughs> dropped a cigarette. No matter what, he never dropped a cigarette. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, uh, he was the one that got me started. Before he became a police officer for the city of Bridgeport, he was a housing officer. So he knew the lane of the land, too. And these guys were legends. They were very fair, but they didn't take no nonsense. That's how they were. And they were very reputable in the community. So that's how I got it started in narcotics, working with them. And they were the ones that taught me how to be a good police officer. When it came to the people I knew in the street, it was kind of tough. Most of my bandmates that I, I used to perform with, they knew me. They knew what I was all about. They knew I hadn't changed. But a lot of the others that used to come to the clubs and to the what they call the gets direct where we were at to, 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 to perform, they didn't really want anything to do with me because a lot of them were doing things that weren't supposed to be doing including, unfortunately, some of my family members. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of kept their distance. I still was who I was. You know, I just, when I went into the project, I did what I had to do. It was difficult sometimes because you're arresting people that you know. I had to arrest family members. I mean, it, it, it was a tough time for me. It really was. And not everybody back then liked the police. They, they weren't too tickled about us no matter what. Uh, this George Ford Floyd thing took it to another level. But back then, they didn't really didn't care for us anyway. And the drug dealers, they didn't want them nothing. They just want to sell their drugs and they don't want you disrupting their business because they have a business going there in these projects. So that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. And clientele, you know. Oh, yeah. Clientele up the wise you. And it was definitely up the wise you back then. Right, yeah. man. Mm -hmm. Most of our buyers actually came from out of town. Yep. We had a lot of people in Bridgeport, but we had a lot more people from an out of town because uh, unfortunately the drugs in Bridgeport were a lot cheaper than in the other cities. So somebody was a mastermind and knew what they were doing and they were making money handled with this. Mm -hmm. And that's something I heard from a lot of guys that were working in the NYPD side back then that in Harlem, particularly where they were, they were doing street narcotics or in the street crime unit, people would be coming in either from Connecticut or from Jersey for that same reason. The drugs there in that part of Harlem at least were cheaper. And it's, it is, it's sad to see the depths people will go to, you know, it's one thing you know, during a Black Friday sale to get, we, we goof on people that we see on the news trying to get the last television or last PS5, but here's something that can kill you. And people are doing whatever it takes, driving hours, driving, you know, wasting gas to buy something that, you know, if that, something goes wrong in that take, they could be dead on the street and nobody would care. Nobody would know. Yeah, the, 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 the main dealers that came from New York to Bridgeport, they knew this was brand new fertile ground. So there was a lot of them that took over different projects. And there was a little war going on in the city of Bridgeport with the local who didn't want to give it up. And people like, well, Swanee, he, you know, you don't know him, but Swanee was, was one that took over half of Father Panic Village. And I mean, he was at war with them all the time on the other half because they didn't want him there. On top of that, most of the drugs that were brought in, they would go to New York to pick up weight and bring that back and then cut it up and do what they had to do. I mean, it was a crazy time. It was a crazy time. The uh, crack cocaine era came in. Let's see, I came in 83. It came in about 85, 86, somewhere around there. Unfortunately, the first person to bring crack cocaine into the city was my cousin. Mm. He was the first one to take cocaine and flip it and make crack out of it and started selling in uh, Father Panic Village. I ended up getting approached by the feds on that later on when I, I got in narcotics. But uh, he was the first one to bring it in. Uh, I still love him. We're still family, but I was like, you idiot. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what did you do? Yeah, naturally. Naturally. There is something I want to touch on before I dive deeper into the narcotics, and that's youth crime. You know, if you really, and Boston did this a number of years ago, if you really want to drive crime down, there's a myriad of different ways to do it. One of the ways that you can do it is addressing youth crime, particularly teenagers that don't have any guidance or out on the street, just doing things they shouldn't be doing, not necessarily because they're born bad, but because they're just not receiving the right guidance or any guidance to begin with. There was a spate of youth sexual assaults, and there was also youth warrants that had to be executed. It's not easy to go out there and arrest anybody because it's the worst moment of their lives. It's especially not easy to do it when it's children. But tell me about trying to nip youth crime in the bud and trying to help turn them around before they went down an awful course they couldn't come back from. When I was in patrol, I met a lot of young people that I tried to help out. For instance, if you had a bag of marijuana, two bags of marijuana, I'd seize the marijuana. We had officer's discretion. I'd take it. 
I make a file and I turn it in. I'd call your parents or take you to your house and say, look, you need to talk to your kid. You don't have to make an arrest. It wasn't a felony, it was a misdemeanor. Uh, I, I distinctly remember a couple of kids, there was four kids that came to uh, Bridgeport, they were on Park Avenue, and I saw them going to Ruthman's Kitchen. At the time, they sold drugs out of there, not anymore. Now it's a legitimate place, but back then they were selling drugs out of there. And so when the kids came out, one of them had a bag and was looking at it in the sun to see if he had enough. I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? I'm in a patrol car, so I pull them over, and uh, they tried to play like they didn't know what's going on. I says, look, this is how this is going to roll. You're supposed to be in school. You're not. All right. So we can do this one of two ways. I can arrest you or you can give me the stuff. And then after that, you have to give me your phone number. They were a little reluctant. I said, OK, I'll take you. And then they gave it. They gave me the stuff. Mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. Give me your phone number. Don't give me a jive number because I'm making a phone call. Huh? Give me your phone number. Somebody better answer. I called every one of their parents. You should have heard those parents on, wait till I get them home. Oh my God, I'm going to whip them, blah, 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 blah. Long story short, I never saw them anymore. I don't know if they came back or not, but on my watch, I never saw them. The parents couldn't be so, they were so grateful. They couldn't thank me enough. Like, hey, your kids are here at Ruth McKitchen picking up marijuana. How about they're supposed to be in school? Send them home, officer. I'll take care of it. That's how I did it when it came to kids. I mean, I did the best I could for them. Some you couldn't. I mean, if you're selling, um, and unfortunately, with kids that were selling crack cocaine, cocaine, you know, th that's a felony. I, I can't turn, you know, that's there's no officer's discretion there. That's a felony. You have to be arrested. But you could always go to court or you can make a recommendation to the prosecutor or whoever to say, look, try to help this kid. But they did have some things in place, not like now. Back then, I was part of the war on drugs. The war on drugs meant arrest everybody because it's gonna stop crime. We now know that didn't work. You can, yeah. you arrest 20 people, there'll be 20 more out there trying to sell tomorrow because it was supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and Bill Bratton talked about it a while ago when he was on the show, former NYPD commissioner, which is you target the dealer. The buyer's one thing, you know, the, and a lot of these buyers, for the most part, they just need help. If you target the dealers, that's where you can have the most success. And that's partially where they did in New York in the 90s during that particular crime shop under him. But yeah, it was it was a mistaken strategy to say the least. And, you know, around that time, and this is something that's gotten lost in recent years, too, because of how operations have changed, not just for Bridgeport, but nationwide for various police departments. There's not a lot of discretion, I feel, because that one on one interaction where, you know, there's a chance to not I don't want to say ruin someone's life. They're ruining their own lives and making a mistake. But if there's some discretion there, a lot of it's been eliminated by the new rule sets to where, unfortunately, a lot of these have become must arrest situations where maybe they don't need to be. And I'm not saying, you know, lax enforcement, but at the same time, that line an officer, especially a senior officer used to have where he can, he or she can decide. I feel like it's gone now. We still have discretion. Uh, I'm in close touch with uh, the new chief of police for the city of Bridgeport, Chief Rod Porter. Mm -hmm. uh, him and I are friends. We teach at different colleges and we got to know each other well. I actually worked with him before I retired. He had nice. one of my classes in Springfield when I taught yeah. to uh, community and uh, he's achieved it now. The problem with today is they don't have people that want to be police officers anymore. The, the, there's so much anti police rhetoric going on in the United States. A lot of people's like, no, I want to be bothered with that. That's one problem. When it comes to helping people before they get into the system, the courts starting to move that way now. Uh, I believe Chief Porter is working on that now where. When somebody's put in the system, if the officer doesn't have discretion, they can do things to get them going in the right direction, whether it's after school programs, uh, work job uh, training, things along that line. But that takes federal dollars. And right now, the government is not uh, they're, they're kind of stingy on that kind of that money. Uh, but uh, there are things that are taking place. For instance, I know in uh, Bridgeport for a while, they had churches that had mentors. For these kids and they would approach the court systems look send them to our church we'll sit down we'll talk with them we'll meet with them after school things like that so there are things going on but the police department right now is overwhelmed there's nobody nobody wants to be a police officer anymore you know it's it's really a tough sell uh the money's not that great in most departments and on top of that after the george floyd thing everything just went south when it comes to police yeah. officers, not looked at in a good light and i understand it i mean you see one and it's like, wow, look at this. There's got to be more. And there are more. 
But I can tell you, 95% of the police officers across America, they're straight up. They're just trying to do what they're supposed to do. But it, it's a tough job right now. It really is. It really is. <laughs> It is. I hearken back. One of the guys you saw in that montage in the open saying, get on it, Mel. That's from an episode of Cops they filmed in Cleveland in the early 90s. His name is Gary Mullins, and he's been on the show before. And I asked him the concluding seg uh, the rapid fire segment. I asked him, you know, last question here. What advice would you give officers coming on the job now or anybody thinking about it? And he told me straight up and it was funny, but it was also sad at the same time, Ron. He's like, if you want to join civil service now, I'd say take the fire department test. You know, don't to and that's the kind of the sentiment you see a lot of guys saying now. And it's it's sad, but like you said, you hit the nail on the head with everything you just said. It's true. When when people look in the news and they see what police officers are going through, and then they see police officers, the bad ones, because the news sells on negativity. I mean, it is right. what it is. You exactly. know, when, it, when when I'm a when I was a police officer, if I gave someone a sandwich at Dunkin' Donut, that wasn't news. If I went into the school to talk to kids about, you know, getting their life together and a, B, and C, that wasn't news. But seeing a cop jacking somebody up, that's news. Seeing people getting shot up, that's news. That, it, mm -hmm. it is what it is. Um, so when we have perspective, people that want to be police officers or thinking about being police officers, when they see these things, either somebody in the family is saying, don't do it, or it's not worth it, or, or what do you think you're doing, or the pay is not good enough. I can tell you that I teach criminal justice at one of the colleges in Bridgeport and every class I get one or two students that get into law enforcement. I have a whole bunch of cops, marshals. I have one that's going to be an attorney. She's in Princeton. I oh, can't wow. wait for her to get out. I'm like, look, I'm going to hire you because you know, Professor Bailey, take care of me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I have people that are really involved in law enforcement. I think it has a lot to do with the way I present it to them. Look, it's not easy. It's not like it was for no. me. It's just not. But if you care about what you're doing and you care about the people you serve, you're going to be all right. Nobody says you have to stand there and take a beating or, or whatever the case may be. You just have to be more tolerant. You want to be in the community policing, which is the key to what's going on? Well, guess what? You should know everybody on your post. You should be able to go to mom and say, hey, your son just ran away from me. You want to tell him to turn himself in? That's community policing, not waving from the police car. Hey, how you doing? And you keep it moving. That's not community policing. Community policing now is you interact with everybody. They know you. They can call you Ron. They can call you Bailey. They can say, yo. I had one officer got upset because his kids say, yo. He ain't yo, he's Lieutenant Bales. Yo, 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 it is yo. He can call me what he wants. You don't understand the culture. He's not being insulting to me. He's just saying yo because he's glad to see me. So there's a lot of stuff going on that has turned people off. But like I said, I've got a lot of people out there. That I, I got police officers in Massachusetts. I got a police officer in Florida. I got a whole bunch of cops in Bridgeport and I'm not going to tell and throw their names out there because it's like, you know, shh. <laughs> you know, do the best you can, marshals. And like I said, I can't wait for that girl becomes an attorney because she's coming back to Bridgeport and she's going to be my personal attorney. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There, there's a lot to do to get more people involved. It's not as bad as it looks. It really isn't not as bad as it looks. And if you care, you care about people, you're going to love that job. You will. Right. I'll use a baseball analogy. It's really all in how you market it. The reason why the Yankees used to do so well with free agents back in the day is they would give a detailed by detailed pitch of not only the history of the franchise, but also what you can expect from living in New York and basically sold them on the iconic nature of the city and the team. And that's what every, just about every major free agent that I've seen sign with the Yankees over the years would talk about in the introductory press conference. Same thing with policing. If you sell it well enough and you're not selling anything that's jive, you know, you're selling something that's straight up. You're talking you're, and if you talk about it honestly and openly, that really lays it out for the person to look at it and decide, you know what, maybe this is for me. I thought it wasn't, but it might be a career worth pursuing. And there's plenty of guys that get on the job. 25, 30 years later, they retire. And when they're telling their story, they hearken back to that one person that sold it the way you did. And I, have did. A young, I have a young lady that took my class. And I won't say any names. And mm -hmm. uh, she came to me. She says, uh, you know, my father, so-and-so. I says, yeah, he was one of the first people that ran from me when I was a rookie at the police officer. He says, yeah, he loves you to death. He said, you changed his life. He turned you, you, you turned him around. I want to be a police officer. She's now... A state police officer. State wow. Police. <laughs> awesome. because, 
We got to talk. She brought her mother in to meet me. Her mother <laughs> wow. hey, my husband was a mess. You turned him. I was like, OK, all right. But I'm so proud of her because she decided to be a police officer. She's now a state trooper in the city, in the in the state of Connecticut. So it, it's not so much selling. It's like you said, be straight with people. Tell you, look, it's not going to be an easy ride. It's going to be a rough ride sometime. I raided my aunt's house. Huh? I had to raid my aunt's house. And when I raided my aunt's house, she was furious with me. And I was like, look, auntie, I know you're not selling drugs, so this is a warning shot, all right? I'm not taking you this time, but if I come back, you know your kids what they're doing, my cousin. We need to knock this off. When I finished taking all the stuff that I think I got their money, there was no drugs. It was cutting material. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Paraphernalia. Money, a lot of Bob's furniture. I was like, oh, my God, auntie, <laughs> come on now. You know. And she's like, all right, all right. I get a call from my cousin about an hour later when I get back in the office. Okay. Don't go to mom's house no more. We're done. I said, good. Try New Haven. Get the, heck, get the heck out of Bridgeport. Come on, cuz. What's up? And that was the end of it. And I gave my aunt the same break I gave to other elderly people. Like, look, I know it's your son. I know it's your daughter. All right. So I only come here once and give a free ride. Don't have me come back here again. No so office. No, no, no problem. And that's the way it's supposed to be. But imagine you have to raid your aunt's house. But if Not you're fun. a straight up honest cop, you're going to do what you got to do. Exactly. And that's the way it is. In my family, we're still family. I don't mm -hmm. go to some of their cookouts, but we're still family. <laughs> now, I got to ask you about trap, which is tactical response and control. You got into that, or patrol, not control, I should say. And again, it's more of the same thing, high crime areas, drug trafficking areas. Was That's kind of a offshoot, I will say, of what New York had with street crime and a lot of other cities throughout the country with street crime, which is if you put enough smart cops who know the area, and that's where the unit can succeed. Cops like yourself that know it, grew up in it, so they know who's who and how to deal with people more so. So being involved in TRAP and then later on TNT, which we'll get to momentarily, tell me about that because now I don't know if the mindset shifts. The shift of a patrol officer to being in a specialized unit is dramatic, especially if maybe you're working in plain clothes. So tell me about getting into a unit like that and besides the narcotics, what else you guys were looking for in terms of crime? Well, the first, I was in three narcotics units. The first one uh, was formed because it was an emergency. Crack cocaine had just hit the, the streets of Bridgeport. And uh, I was making arrests from a patrol car, which is wild. People don't, officers don't usually do that. So mm -hmm. I got a call. They wanted me to join the, the, the tactical narcotics team. And so I did. The reason why the first unit was, was started was because there was a pastor on Colorado Avenue and the drug group over there at the time was selling the drugs close to the church. So the pastor went to them and says, look, could, could you sell somewhere else if you're going to not, not run the church? And that night they broke into his church and left cocaine in the bathroom with a line, you know, like, you know, and a note. And I was like, oh, my God. So that was the first narcotics unit. So I was only in there for about two and a half, three years. And it was a it was a it was newly formed. And I got rotated out. When I got rotated out, they put me in tactical response and patrol, the trap team you're talking about. That was different. That was Chief Sweeney's baby. What that was was the buyers. We had a, a slew of buyers coming in from out of town because our stuff was cheap. So what we would do was strictly enforce all motor vehicle laws. You had to have your seatbelt on. Uh, you had your car better be, the lights better be working right. Uh, one of the things we did that was kind of funny, but it wasn't, when people were pulled into Father Panic, for instance, to go run in to get their drugs, they knew exactly where to go. Well, when they pulled in, they would usually just park in the middle of the street, like at least four feet away from the curb and get out and run in. And we would roll right up. Because that's illegal. You have to legally park your car. I know it sounds like you're really picking at it, but it's like we're trying to stop the drug trade. And that's what we were doing. So when the buyer came back out, we had the driver, we had the buyer. The buyer usually had the drugs or they'd swallow it. But our job was to disrupt business. So we were doing motor vehicles, checking for cars for this, checking. We pulled a lot of guns out off the street. There was a lot of things we did legally. You know, by doing it that way, that's what tactical response and patrol was. We would hang out in certain projects for three or four hours to disrupt the trade, things like that. We were high visibility. It was different from the narcotic use, and that's what trap was all about. It was very effective. I have to, I have to admit, you know, uh, I wasn't a fan. Of, I was really a fan of Chief Sweeney, but uh, 
uh, he, he had the right idea. He really did. And we did shut down the buying trade that we came in and along with other things that we did to show high visibility. Mm -hmm. It's I liken it to getting Capone on taxes, just the overall mentality and, and, and methodical nature of it. Did they know he did worse? Did they know he committed crimes as serious as murder? Yes, obviously. But they got him on that to build bigger cases. Same thing. You're getting a guy, let's say he jaywalked. Or let's say, like you just said, he parked his car illegally. You're not getting them for that. That's not the reason why you're right, right, uh, trying to arrest them or even at the very minimum write them a summons. It's because you know there's a bigger crime at work here. And it, that's where not only discretion, but knowing that patrol guide comes in handy. Because especially if somebody tries to come back with an attorney and sue you down the road, you can cite the reason why we got It's an effective way to build the case. And as you said, you know, he had the right idea. He had the right idea. It's a yeah. great specialized approach. He also did the um, the uh, the barricades, he had <clears> throat> his, throat> um, the, the Jersey barriers, and he had them placed strategically throughout the city of Bridgeport where the drug trade was. And if you didn't know your way in and out of there, you were you were stuck. I mean, yeah. you were police cars. It's like, oh my God, how do you get in? How do you get out? Those there were. It was all about disrupting the trade, especially mm -hmm. the buyers. We wanted the buyers to stay at the city, try to hurt the trade that way. It was. Kind of effective, but again, supply and demand. You want something bad enough, you're gonna find a way to do what you got to do to get your stuff. In. Exactly. But it, it's just it was the another nature tool. of it. It was another tool, and it worked. I'll ask you. Usually, and I've covered this before on the show. We're talking with Ron Bailey. This is Volume Eleven of the Beat Profiles of Police Nationwide here on the Mike the New Haven Podcast. Where you find narcotics, you usually find firearms. Were you guys putting a dent in a lot of the illegal guns on the street too back then? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the mentality back then was. Where there's drugs, there's guns because they have to enforce their their place. Uh, I did a lot of uncover, undercover work, but a lot of my work was surveillance. That was my specialty. Mm. Uh, I could sneak into any place, anytime, anywhere. I mean, I had all kinds of disguises. We even had some guys from New York came up to see what we were doing because they'd heard about the arrest. We were making thousands of arrests. It's like, what are they doing in Bridgeport? So they actually had a couple of police officers from New York come and ride along to see what we were doing. Uh, the good thing about surveillance, for instance, uh, you get a key from the housing project so, to a certain abandoned apartment. Uh, you make sure you get it from the right person because we had housing people that would tell the drug dealers what we were doing. So but anyway, I get the key from a person that I trust. I get my uh, bummy clothes. I'd have my cans in the bag along with my gun and my radio and everything else. And I'm dragging the can and I'm limping along and and when nobody's looking, I sneak into one of the abandoned apartments. That abandoned apartments, the boards, the, the windows are boarded up. I have my drill. I drill a hole quietly with my scope so I can see who I want to <laughs> see. And if you sit there patiently long enough, you'll see the person who got the money. You'll see where the drugs are stashed. You'll see the people bringing it in and dropping it off. You will see who has the gun. Now, I'm doing the surveillance. I'm there for several hours. When I see the gun, that's it. The set's got to shut down because we have a gun on set. And I notify the team, hey, there's a gun on set. It's a blue Mercury. Guy's got on all black. He's got a white uh, cap on. He just got into the car. He's got the gun on this. Uh, you can see all these things if you've got the right position to see these things. So we were extremely effective with the surveillances that we did. So mm -hmm. that was a really intense tool and i got that tool from tony brown because tony brown told me when he's in the housing project he used to sneak into apartments and do his his uh his surveillance for the housing project but he didn't have the equipment i had i went and bought a scope you know i my drill you know I, I i really went all out because i really wanted to be effective in what i was doing and we did some damage we really did Oh, of course. And that attention to detail and being able to relay relay that information is the difference quite frankly between cops being able to make a safe arrest and get that gun off the guy or gal or getting killed. You know, oh. all you have to do is miss one detail and an officer can get seriously hurt if not killed. So that surveillance is critical and knowing how to blend in too. And that's the interesting thing, because especially if you're working on these projects as a native of the city, as an active cop on the street, you certainly weren't one to hide. Some of these people might know you and say, hey, isn't that Bailey? Because if it's not sure, it sure as heck looks a lot like him. So I'm glad you mentioned the disguises, because as you talked about, no black heroes, you had to go all out with that, too. It got to a point where people started to realize who I was. Because when they hear, the people that didn't know me, they heard, well, there's this black police officer. His name is Bailey. 
they were looking for a dark skinned person. They weren't looking for you no know, fair skin. I'm African American, I'm fair skin. So yeah. that went good for a while. <laughs> yeah. and a lot of the disguise I had was all kind of like, you know, cover up hoodie, the sweatshirt, the bandana, the whole nine yards. But then it got to a point where I got completely exposed and I had to change everything. So I went to a theatrical store in New Haven, Brantford line. They had the good stuff. I'm not talking about that cheap, you know, costume jewelry stuff. They had the fake beard with the mesh. So you glue it to your face and the skin color would come through. They had all of the good stuff. I went and got those things. And I mean, with glasses, a bandana, a beard, you know, it's like, who am I? Where am I? And I made sure that they saw the real Bailey before I came in. I would come by in a patrol car with a uniform on clean shaven, you know, hey, you know, oh, that's Bailey, that's Bailey. And then I'd come back out in my drag. They weren't looking for that person. The, most of the time, the bum worked. The bum always worked. You know, yeah. nobody wants somebody that's hawking and spit and, and, and you know, dragging. Man, it's like, oh, God, get out of here. Get off. I actually had one drug dealer say, man, could you go somewhere else? You're disgusting. <laughs> okay. And then I'd end up sneaking around to another apartment, and I got to watch him. So it, it really was effective. And don't laugh, but I actually wore a dress one time. I think I really you talk about that. <laughs> it was for a long distance shot. Drug dealers aren't threatened by girls. Yes. So I parked not. the car. I had the baby seat, you know, and I <laughs> got out the car with my dress on, my high heels. High heels, man, them things were cute. And I had to open the door so it looked like I was fixing my baby in the, in the seat. And they were looking at me from P.T. Barn. They said, oh, that's just a woman. And I sat back in the car, and I did my surveillance right there in front of them. They didn't even know I hit them. Didn't even know. <laughs> you got to get creative. You yeah. got to get creative because they're sure as heck creative, especially oh, with what they're, they're doing. No dealers aren't stupid. They're smart. They're smart. They're just Making bad choices. Don't make no sense. Yeah, I, I would never call them dumb because you were intelligent enough to bring it in. You were intelligent enough to cut it up. You marketed your stuff. So you're intelligent, but you should have been intelligent enough to do something else beside that. So I never put anybody down. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. And I've heard enough stories on this show that I don't make that assumption either. I says, they're not stupid people. They're just making stupid choices. You can't. You can't. Yeah, you can't. You can't underestimate them. I'll get to TNT in a second, but this is a little sidebar here. So one of the cases involved this informant who is since dead. He, he died in a fire. I don't know if it was an arson fire or just a house caught fire, but he was after you for a while. His name was Cruz, as you identified him in the book. And I believe that tied into one of the narcotics cases. And that's one of the wildest stories of the book because it involved a shooting on top of that. Tell, tell, tell the audience about that. It's not familiar with that story. There was a point where, <clears throat> as a police officer, when Ted Meekins told me about representing the best of us, there was a lot of abuse going on and it wasn't allowed on my watch. So if a police officer tried to do it, it wasn't gonna happen on my watch. If I didn't report it, I would stop them. So I wasn't the favorite son. I was the favorite son in narcotics, but I still was not accepted because of my position. You're not beating up anybody on my watch. It's just not gonna happen. And we're not going to be stealing. We're not going to be doing any of those things. And so there was a lot of resentment. Even in the second narcotics team that I was in, they were like leery of me. Like, is this guy going to turn on us? Is, hey, you don't do anything wrong. You're nothing to worry about. But anyway, long story short, it got to a point where upper management was not happy with me. They were happy with the work, but they weren't happy with me. And the state had this guy, and I changed his name. I put Cruz, but it, it's a it, he has a different name. And Cruz was supposedly this really top informant that everybody believed. He was, you know, 100%. And it came out in the paper later on after we had our conf confrontation, but I was supposedly selling drugs, using drugs, sleeping with prostitutes, sleeping with kids. I'm like, Dang, you guys need to put me in jail. I'm the worst of the worst. And this was all a part of the, the problem with police abuse. I was also an advocate about discrimination. I was not having that, not on my watch. And I sued the city if you read the book. Mm -hmm. Five times I was in federal court, now, six times in federal court. And I won all six cases. So mm -hmm. it wasn't make-believe. It actually happened. So I wasn't their favorite son. But long story short, they put this guy Cruz on me. And I mean, he, anything he wanted to do, he could do. He would show up at my jobs. He would, 
He would uh, show up at the clubs. He knew where I was. Somehow he knew where I was. It all culminated to a, a time where I was on a turnpike coming home with a correction officer, a friend of mine from a club. And this guy tried to run me off the road. And when he took a second pass, I shot at the car. But I shot at the tire. I was trying to blow his tire so I could get away from him. And um, he came into the police department, again, making a long story short. And I thought he was going to hit me. So I hit him first. I wasn't about to wait. And I, uh, I I heard him. I heard him pretty bad when I hit yes, him. You did. Yes, you did. Uh, they ended up, ended up uh, coming and getting him, and they took him to Massachusetts, so an eye clinic up there because I detached his retina. So I got arrested. I got. They tried to sue me. They tried to terminate me the whole nine yards. But this guy was relentless. He was also after another police officer that unfortunately was using drugs, and he got him. Long story short, I was able to beat the state and all. Listen. I'm not selling drugs. I'm not using drugs. This prostitute kids thing, that's ridiculous. I have children. Uh, so that just went by the wayside. Eventually just gave up on that nonsense. Uh, I ended up going to federal court and suing them again. Uh, I got a lot of money on that one. Uh, one of my friends at the time was working with the state and he had did an investigation on me. His name was Billy Chase. And Billy Chase cleared me. But they didn't want to hear it because they wanted to believe this informant. For some reason, they wanted me off the job. I think we know what the underlying reason was. Mm -hmm. But I just refused to back down. I wasn't going to go for it. Uh, unfortunately, Billy Chase isn't here anymore. But uh, he would have been proud of me. Uh, he would have been proud of me. But anyway, a uh, long story short, the informant, he was up in New London. And there was a mysterious fire where he died sleeping. On his back, which makes no sense. I mean, if you if there's a fire in the room, you're gonna get up and get out of there. But it was mysterious, and they I don't know if they looked at me and thought I had done it or not. I'm like I'm not like that. But the person that he did get fired, and that person that went to jail, that police officer, they were looking at him closely. But nothing ever came of it. Nobody ever found out who killed that informant. And I say killed because that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, they just said he died under mysterious circumstances. They're like, yeah, right. This guy was the worst of the worst. But uh, yeah, that's a true story. That's a true story. That guy died in a fire up in uh, New London. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you see individuals that are harmed before the fire starts. It was never specified if that was the case. But I'm like, yeah, dying. On, it's one, Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that made him <clears throat> so reliable when it came to me and they really all believed it. There was a police officer that was working with the state narcotics. And this police officer at the time, they didn't know was crooked. He was taking drugs and money off the street and keeping it. Mm -hmm. And he was working with Cruz and said, yep, Bailey did A, B, and C. So that's why they really believed it. And eventually they ended up catching him and he went to jail. Never got an apology for it though. I never, but that's all right. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I prevailed, I prevailed. Yeah. Your reputation was pristine afterwards, especially what you were dealing with early on with the ad hoc committee, too, which was the old guard. And I don't say that in the friendly terms at all. That was another thing you had to overcome. Yeah, the, the ad hoc committee was a group of uh, white officers that were hell bent on doing whatever they wanted to do to black and Latinos in the street. Uh, they couldn't stand the gardens, which I was a part of. That's a group of black and Latino officers uh, that were formed in the city of Bridgeport to fight discrimination. Uh, the new group, the K-5 that came along, they were the absolute worst. The chief wouldn't even acknowledge them, but uh, uh, it's not like that anymore. Um, yeah, it's changed a lot. It, changed. It's more along the lines, if you're talking about the city of Bridgeport, it's more along the lines of favoritism. You have more white officers than black and Latinos, and you have more white supervision than black and Latinos. So if one of my buddies is white and he's my friend, I'm going to take care of him. It's not necessarily discrimination more than it is more than it would be disparate impact, but it's not intentional discrimination, but I'm taking care of my buddy. It's more like that now. Back then, it was like, no, nope, you're white, you're right, black, get out. You know, it was one of those type of things. Cartoons right. on the walls with gorillas, with bananas, and the, the N-word, and you name it. Those were the things we went through back then. It's not like that now. Yeah. Every time I think yeah, you see it in a lot of different cities. It's more so of a nepotism thing because it's the same thing no matter where you go. Even if, like, let's say there's a Spanish officer and he's got a guy who's Spanish who we just – they're just buddies. They're looking after each other. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, Spanish to black or whatever, yeah, if there's a nepotism thing in play, that's kind of where you can get hurt because any job, you know, if you're not looking at the best candidate for them being the best candidate, you're going to end up jacking up your corporation, or in this case, a police department. 
Exactly. Exactly. When I was a lieutenant working out at the chief's office, uh, one of the things I had to do was to check offices for drugs and uh, white, black or otherwise. If you were if I caught you on drugs, you were suspended for 30 days. You had to go for counseling. And that was your one shot. After that, I get to check you for the next 18 months. And if I catch you again, anytime you're you're done. And I mean, I had plenty of officers of colors. Hey, can you no, I can't give you a break. We don't do that. Come on, man. You got a gun and you are using drugs. We can't have that. So it, no, it, there's a lot of times when you can help an officer out, not because of their color, because you can help them out. But when it came to something like that, uh abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, citizens' rights, you're not having that. Now, if you're a good, a good supervisor, you're not doing it. You're not having it. So. Right, you can't look the other way. And I'll get to yeah. your role as a supervisor momentarily when you made sergeant in 03. But a couple of things I wanted to touch on, too. TNT was another one. And that, you know, is kind of continuing the trap method. That was another method that took off countrywide. A lot of police departments started incorporating those teams, particularly in high crime areas, more so along the lines of getting guns and, and drugs off the street, you know, and investigating all the activity that came with it. You mentioned surveillance. Then there's the federal collaboration. Some cities had an easy time collaborating with the FBI and DEA. Other cities didn't because they felt the FBI was trying to come in, be big brother and take over or other federal agencies as well. And, and some cities, there just is that tension. It exists in New York, for example. At least it did back then. Your relationship with the FBI and DEA back then and TNT, what was it like? The FBI, my relationship with them was great. The DEA was great, except they were using crews. I was like, OK, you can be using that knucklehead. <laughs> Whatever I do, I'm doing with you. Whatever you do yeah. with him, we understand. Okay, fine. Um, I had no problem with the outside agency, statewide narcotics, DEA, FBI, uh, the, the Valley uh, Narcotics Unit. No problem. The thing about the FBI, they're going to get the glory no matter what. I didn't care. Do whatever you got to do. If you want to take the glory, take the glory. Billy Chase couldn't stand like Bill. The FBI, all right? They're going to shine. So just do what you got to do. So I got along great with them. I used to get calls from them all the time. I uh, I don't know if you remember this in the book. I got a call from JJ who was working with the FBI. Yes. And yeah. And he says, uh, Brother Bailey, we need to see you in the office. I was like, what What do you got now? Another major drug case for me? I was like, you know, no, no, no. We, and he wasn't laughing. He wasn't drunk. He said, we, we need to see you. We'll see you tomorrow. So and so. And he hung up. I was like, that's not like JJ. What the heck is going on? <clears throat> when I get there, they sit me down. Now, remember, I'm working with these guys on a regular basis. And there's two of them in there looking at me at the corner of the eye. And then JJ standing there with his partner says, uh, I want to ask you a question. He says, yeah. He says, uh, you were on East Main Street in a liquor store. I says, yeah. What are you watching me? Follow me? What, what, what were you doing in that store? I was like, Jay, you know I don't drink? Yeah, that's right. We know you don't drink. All right, look. I cook with wine. I cook. So I picked up some wine to go home and cook. What's going on? And they had like a sigh of relief. I'm like, were well, you going to tell me what's going on or not? What? And they took me in the back and they showed me the cameras. They had this liquor store under surveillance because there was a cop selling steroids out of the, out of the liquor store. And he'd walk <laughs> around, like you said, in the department. He'd walk around with a big smile like he was a hot shot. Yeah, and I was like, okay, all right, uh, uh, you don't have to work. No, you go. To, no, I'm not going there no more. I, I'll go somewhere else. But uh, they had set it up, and they ended up arresting him later. I'm like, and they were so relieved because they thought I was a part of that. I mean, they looked at bad. I'm like, I, I don't drink. You know, I don't drink. What am I doing in that liquor store? So I'm like, you don't have to worry about me no more. And they ended up taking it down later on. But uh, I had no problem with them. And like I said, whenever we did a major thing, they would get the glory. I didn't care. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as the job gets done, Listen, it's fine. That's all I cared about getting the job done. I took drugs off the street. They were users. I was able to refer them for help, the ones that did want it. I was happy with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a, uh, and this is not my feelings. I've had FBI agents on the show, and I got nothing but respect for them. But some of the NYPD guys back then, there was a, a saying, Raz in the FBI, that the FBI stood for famous but incompetent for, for that same reason. We went on a day with one of the FBI agents one time, and he was so uncomfortable in the van. And I was like, what's the matter with you, buddy? You know, he's like, oh, I'm not well-liked. I mean, what do you mean you're not well-liked? Well, you know, you guys don't really trust the FBI. I was, I was like, is that? That was like one of my first encounters with the FBI. I says, well, 
hang with me because I don't have no problem with you. I'm not doing anything wrong. If you check me out, go ahead. You know, and, but they felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. because they thought we didn't really like them. I guess a lot of them did, but I had no problem. With them. I, I respected them. You know, I, right. I had no problem with them. Actually, as a matter of fact, one of the FBI agents turned me on to a SWAT school that I could go to to get my SWAT training that I needed because they knew the best of everything. So, yep, I'm going to ask you about that next. But it's it's it, I think with anything, and this is the perspective I've gotten from both sides, uh, especially talking with my friends out of the bomb squad in New York. On an agent to agent level or agent to officer level, no problems. It's all that bureaucracy at the top where the you know the the, the heads of each agency maybe aren't seeing eye to eye. But on the ground level, nobody really cares. It's just can you do your job effectively or not? As long as you can, who cares? I used to get approached by them all the time. You know how to sneak into this place? Yep. You know how to sneak into that place? Yep. How do you know all these things? Come on, man. I lived in the project. How could I not know the lay of the land? Come on, my brother. We can do this. Yeah, exactly. uh, so we, I had a ball. I mean, I, you know. We did what we had to do. Uh, we didn't hurt anybody. We did it the right way, and I was fine with that. So, mm -hmm. and they can have the glory. Yeah, as long as the guys are going to jail that need to go to jail, hey, whoever wants to take the glory can yeah, take it. We have that inner now. satisfaction. Some of those guys are coming out now after twenty five years, and I'm seeing them. And they're giving me hugs, like, man, you know, I messed up. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. The feds took it. They they took you under the RICO Act. You know what that means? But mm -hmm. they they changed. They didn't change the RICO Act, but they started to let people out and saying, okay, being in jail for life behind drugs, that's not necessarily the right thing. So they did reduce it and let some of them out. You know, so some of them I do see some of the major players I'm seeing them now. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, we shake hands and I go my way and they go there. No problem. Yeah, and that's fine. Cause I, I can understand that. Cause as long as there's not any violent crimes that you yourself committed or you ordered be committed in association with that trafficking. I can see that. Now, if you got guys that have engaged in the other, and a lot of them have, well, then they get, they should stay in jail for life. But somebody that, you know, was just selling and strictly selling, it's not right. But yeah, you're right. They shouldn't be in jail for life over that. So before I get to Blackwater, which I do want to ask you about, and then you make in Boston 03, Joe Maliga is in the chat. He's a retired correctional officer. And anytime I get a fire department or police department guest, him and I's running joke is ask him if they ever delivered a baby. So during your years of patrol, did you ever deliver a baby? Thank God. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that, my brother. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's something I didn't do. There was an officer from Ansonia. His name was Joe. Uh, he delivered two. Mm. And I just shook his hand and congr congratulations because uh, I, I don't want to do that. I've I, I seen a couple of my kids come in this where I'm like, I'm good with that. No. Yeah. No. no, no I <laughs> <laughs> understandable understandable so blackwater you went down to blackwater and that's about the most elite swat training you can get it doesn't matter what department you're in being certified in swat is a big accomplishment going down there and passing that course is an even bigger one and like you said you had your connects in the fbi they got you hooked up with that now you'd been involved in tactical operations for a while but i imagine being down there and seeing the training involved that had to be an eye-opener to say the least it was. It was the best train I ever received in my entire career. The reason I went to Blackwater was because they were forming a SWAT unit and they told me I wasn't qualified. That was another lawsuit on discrimination that was coming. I was like, how can I not be qualified? Well, you've had too many shootings. Let me get this straight. I've had too many shootings to be in a SWAT team that <laughs> you're not making any sense. So they told me I couldn't be a part of the team. And I was like, you can never tell me I can't do something. So I took my vacation time. I took my money. The FBI agent told me about this school called Blackwood. He said, you can't get FBI training, but if you go there, it's just as good, if not better. I went there, Moyoc, North Carolina. I did my two weeks there, and I came back, and I had my SWAT certificate that said I was qualified, but I wasn't done. I went to another place in Maryland. I forgot the name of the place in Maryland to be a supervisor. Was SWAT and I got that training done and I came back and it just so happened that the officer that said I wasn't qualified who was later found guilty of intentional discrimination against me in court didn't want to take it he didn't want to take my certification so I just politely said well this is how this is going to go I have nothing but respect for you but you're wrong I'm qualified you can put this in my file because I earned it and it belongs in there it's police related well, I'll see you in federal court on this in addition to you denying me my spot in SWAT. He put it in the file. And like I said, when we got to federal court, he was found intentionally discriminatory towards me 
for not allowing me in that SWAT team. And when he decided to be a chief, he never was able to make one because he had that umbrella hanging on him over him wherever he went. Mm -hmm. Payback. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. But you know what? You, you, he actually wanted to be a chief at Yale. And he told the chief at the, the, the assistant chief that was there at the time, Chief Higgins, who's now the chief for the state of Connecticut. He's, he, he's the superintendent for the state of Connecticut. He runs mm -hmm. the state police. And he was going, he was applying. And this guy went to him and says, look, I hope we can get along when I get you this job. And Higgins like, is this guy crazy? I said, no, that, that's who he is. I'm not going to say his name because I don't want to embarrass him. It's like, that's, that's who right. he is. But Chief Higgins became the chief for Yale and stayed there until he became the superintendent for the state police. And that guy ended up retiring. He never yeah. got a job as chief or assistant chief. Have mm -hmm. a great day. Yeah. And that's, that's how, that's how it should be. All you have to do was just let the guy be in SWAT. That's all you had to do. Me in, but somebody that went on vacation and wasn't able to take the, the, the oral exam, he let him get in because he knew of his professionalism. Was, let me get this straight. Everybody had to take this oral examination, including me. This guy was on vacation, but you're going to let him in because you know of his qualifications. You think that's going to fare well in federal court? Well, I'm making decisions. I'm so glad you are. Yeah, keep I building the case. Cat. Yeah, keep building the case. That's essentially I what he did. did. End of subject. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was very pissed when I became a chief, but that's all right. I Good. love I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> this is the Beat Volume 11 on the Mike DeNaven podcast, and it's been a fun one, as I knew it would be. Making Sergeant in 2003, I feel like everything in the first 20 years of your career, because like I said, you went through the academy twice, which was a different story in and of itself, um, was a preparation for you making boss. Because you see guys, and I'm not knocking those that do, if you're qualified to do it, and you're, you know, you're good at your job, whatever that job may be in the first responder community, by all means, take those tests if you want to. Um, but guys that make boss with more time on, you know, it's it's I think it's better that way as opposed to if you hit sergeant with five, six, seven years on because you've had truly a lot of time to experience the street. You've had time to guide younger officers coming into the department. So therefore, the transition into the role of sergeant is easier. And tell me if I'm wrong, because even if you're not officially a boss, naturally, because younger officers are looking at you already for guidance and tutelage, you're kind of a boss without the actual title until you make sergeant. So did you find that to be the case or was it still a little bit intimidating when you finally got promoted in 03? When I became a sergeant, Chief Chapman at the time assigned me in the project with 20 officers for a community policing effort because he was a big, he was big on community policing. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my God, they're pulling me out of narcotics and they're going to put me in the projects with the people that I've arrested. It's going to be a tough sell because how do you go from being this guy that's arresting everybody for narcotics and drugs? And, you know, now my name is known, even if you didn't know who I was until it was too late. And now I've got to go into the projects and make friends. It wasn't an easy sell. The first couple of weeks was really, really tough for me because nobody wanted to accept me. A little girl was walking, and I was walking in the project with some of my people, and her and a friend. She had a friend with her, and they were like, are you a bad police officer? Are you a good police officer? I said, well, I hope I'm a good one. And mm -hmm. so she says, well, how good are you? I said, do you know the game Eeny Meeny? And she said, huh? Eeny Meeny. Eeny Meeny, Dissolini, Ucha Cha Manini. It's not patty cake. It's Eeny Meeny, Dissolini. And so she says, I know that game. We were on the drive in P.T. Barnum playing Ooh, Meanie, Dissolini, Ucha, Cha, Manini, Acha, Racha, I, I, would, I don't want to go through the whole thing. I don't want to sound like a dork. But <laughs> you don't know her. This kid was so enthused. The next thing I know, my people are walking. I got a line of girls competing with me to keep up. I learned Eeny Meanie because I have a daughter and I played it with her and we were real fast at it. And so people saw that. And they're like, oh, my God, Bailey is not that bad. The kids love me. And when they saw me, they would run up to me. The next thing you know, it opened up the door. Now people are talking to me. I had another man come to me after he saw how kind I was to the kid. Uh, I want to say his name because he was a sweetheart, but I don't want to say his name because it might embarrass his family. But he came up to me and says, Bailey, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, absolutely. 
It says, um, I sell numbers over here. Excuse me? I sell numbers out of my apartment. Apartment? Is that going to be a problem? No, sir. I don't know what you do in your apartment, and I'm not here for that. I'm here to see that you're safe, and I'm here for community policing. So I can sell my numbers? I don't hear you. <laughs> he looked at me and smiled. He gave me a hug and went back on his apartment. I'm like, I'm not interested in what you're doing in your apartment. You're not doing it on the street. You're not doing anything that's going to harm me or my people. And I'm here for community policing. The next thing you know, I get invited to come to the housing meetings. And the housing people want my team to come to their meetings from now on when they have their cookouts, when they have their basketball camps. And that's how I got involved in community policing. And it went from one project to another just that way. And that's the way it should be. And it's started off of a fluke, a child, a little girl. Yeah. You know, and, and I hearken back to another story you told in the book where I think there was a guy, and listen, we talked earlier about discretion, and I'm paraphrasing here. He was he was a drug dealer, but he was someone that uh, was doing it not because he was a malicious guy, but he was trying to support his kids. And, you know, I think you were chasing somebody one day, and he, he pointed you in the direction of where the guy was running. He Even sure discretion did. like that. I gave him a break one day. Uh, I knew he was just taking care of his kids. He wasn't no flash cars, no fancy clothes, no nothing. He's trying to feed his family. And I knew he was dirty that day. And I just said, Lord, please. He got nervous. I was like, look, just keep going to your apartment. Because I think he was going to throw it down. Because mm -hmm. he had his pockets. like, look, just go to your apartment. And he looked at me and said, oh, OK, baby, OK. And I just went on about my business because I knew what he was doing. He's trying to feed his family. And I mm -hmm. completely understood that. Wasn't doing was right. What he wasn't doing was right. It wasn't right what he was doing, but I just decided, no, not today. In the meantime, I got into a fight with this drug dealer, and it was a massive fight. I mean, we were going from building to building. It was one of those. I forgot about this. Oh, tell that story, please. God, I gotta, By, you got to tell that story. <laughs> you want me to tell the whole story? Yes, I, I had some drugs, and I got out of my car to approach him. And he threw the drugs down and started to take off. And I'm running behind him. And he was high. He was high off of it. If you know anything about crack cocaine, you can hit somebody with a steel pipe. It ain't going to do no good. Here I am, this tough black belt, third degree. You know, I'm fighting with this guy like this no tomorrow. Nothing phases him. We went from building to building. I finally lost sight of him because I'm trying to catch my breath. That same person that I let go, he looked like that. And not as his head. And I was like, he didn't want to say anything because people, you know, he didn't want anybody. To sh he was telling me where he was. When I went into that last building, oh, my God, he was upstairs waiting to fight again. I was like, really, dude, am I going to have to kill you? You know, but I was just kind of like, stop. And he took a swing at me and I gave him a roundhouse and he rolled down the stairs and I heard him go, ah! I thought I killed him. I was like, oh, God, please not because he hit his head. If you know anything about Father Panic Village, the, the, the stairs going down are made of brick, but the end of it has those steel pieces on it. Yeah, yep. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I've killed this guy. They're going to swear to God that I killed them on purpose. That dude got up and ran again. I was like, forget it. I'm just going to shoot you. You know, I was just yelling because I was so silly. I was like, I can't stop this guy. So I jumped on his back. He ran out with me holding on to him. He fell. And by that time, backup came. That's the only way we were able to stop him. I, he was just super human. It, true story. But you know what? I would have lost the only person ever in my career if it wasn't for that guy that I gave a break to. He was the one that told me where he was. Right. Yeah. And I forgot the other layer of that story. I remember the first half. And that's why I wanted you to tell you it again. You really read that book. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I, I, like I told you, I couldn't put it down. And I wanted to read it earlier when you stopped by the house many years ago to give it to mom. And mom's like, no, you're too young for it. I was like 14, 15 at the time. I'm like, oh, there please. Was a lot of cuss words and stuff in there. That was the old me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I got to 19, you know, 20 years of age and we were all sitting at home during 2020, I'm like, you think I could finally have the book now? And she's like, okay, you're a little older now. Here you go. And that's where I'm like, whoa. I knew you were the real deal because she would tell me some of the stories too. But when I read the book from front, you know, to back, and I was like, oh my God. And hence, you know, while you're here reliving some of those stories tonight on the podcast, because I mean, my goodness, and that, it, that drug along with PCP, I don't care who you give it to. They could take a guy like John Jones, the UFC heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson, is prime, give him a run for his money in the ring. <laughs> That's how strong that drug is. You don't feel anything. 
the PCP made you super strong, but it also uh, it heated you up. Yeah, that made you take the your clothes off. Off. I watch a guy strip down butt naked, and then he defecated on a police car, on the hood of a police car. And I was like, are you kidding me? I mean, it, it, it was that bad. Like, who would take anything like that? And I wasn't there, but I read in the news where this guy was on PCP in Bridgeport, and he ate a piece of this guy's face. Yes, I remember that story, too. It was in News I 8. I don't believe that. I mean, uh, are you kidding me? I mean, I thought crack was bad. Mm -hmm. that that takes another that's another level right there yeah so. and I, I go back to the opening of this show the last segment where the guy's yelling put it on the paper uh that's another episode of cops from philly in the early 90s same thing guy was on pcp i think somebody is actually really sad some he wasn't a drug guy somebody slipped it into his drink and he oh. went crazy and he tried to break into this guy's house the guy defended his property shot the guy didn't realize he'd been shot because he's on pcp it took seven cops in that episode to restrain him that's and he was already a big guy to begin with there was a guy in my police car, and we weren't sure what he was on. We knew he was on something. And I had already handcuffed him. I put him in the police car, and he's banging his head up against the glass. And I'm yelling, would you please stop? And then all of a sudden, I see him, like, rear up in the seat, and he's pulling, and he pulled. He pulled and ripped his hand out of the handcuff. There was blood all over the car. And I'm like, okay, I'm not opening this door till we get some more backup here. And we, we, that was TNT at the time. I've mm -hmm. never seen anybody in my life except for that one guy pull his hands through the hoop and rip his hands. He didn't feel nothing. Blood dripping all over the place. I oh mean, it was a mess. Uh, we called for several backup officers. He's sweating. He's pull I mean, you can have that. And they sneak yeah. the marijuana and everything else. I'm like, oh, come on, guys. You guys are not, you, you know, need to leave that street stuff alone. But if it's cheap, people would use it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the sad part. Before I get to you, Megan, Lieutenant, uh, in a little bit, one thing I did want to ask about. Wilbur Chapman was, he came from the NYPD world. He was in the NYPD forever, about 30 years or so. Yes. So he retires, becomes chief. He was there from 2000 to 2005. He was there when Bratton came in with Jack Maple and all them and brought in Comstat, which was a huge part of the reason why the crime fell in New York in the mid to late 90s. He brought Comstat with him. Now, Comstat's pretty much used nationwide. All police departments, even if they don't call it that, have a variation of it. I don't know if that was your first brush with it, but it's a valuable tool when used correctly and not used punitively. What did you think of it? It was great. It was a great tool. Not many people bought into it because it's like, OK, how is this going to help us? is computer generated crime figures. You take the files and all the reports and you put them in the computer. And if you put them in there right, you should be able to see where all the rapes is, where all the burglaries are, where all the robberies are, where all the stolen cars are, what time these things are happening. And as a supervisor, you're supposed to look at these statistics, which I was running community policing at the time and I had the projects. One of the problems we had was we had a lot of burglaries that was taking place between, if I remember correctly, it was like 10 or 11 at night to like 2 in the morning on a Friday near Saturday, sometimes on a Sunday. So we had a big problem in Trumbull Gardens. And when I made my report, I had to send it up to the chief's office because I couldn't go up there. At the time, I was a sergeant. So Chief Chapman, I mean, Captain Chapman, there's a chief chapman, a captain chapman. Captain mm -hmm. Chapman will take my report and say, okay, what do you have that you're going to do about this? And I gave him what I was going to do. What I did was I knew what time the burglary was taking place, and I knew where they were taking place in that project. What I did was I hired overtime officers to stay there from 10 to 12, and then they had to leave. So there was no burglaries from 10 to 12 like there usually is. But that was just a ruse. When the patrol cars left, I had unmarked cars with police officers out there watching. And from 2 to 4 in the morning, we killed it. We got all of the people that were involved in the burglaries because the unmarked cars were there. And they didn't know we were there. And I settled the problem. So Chief Chapman loved it. It cost a little money, but guess what? We shut down the burglary. But again, going back to this computer generated, which I teach in my class, CompStat is wonderful because all the, the figures are there. You just have to look and see what you have. But here's the thing. 
Low level supervision is supposed to come up with a plan to give to the assistant chief so they can present it to the chief as to what you're going to do to address that problem. And you also have to look back the year before and a couple of weeks before to see what the trend is and if things are better or worse than it was in 23 compared to 24. So that's why it really, really was a very good tool. Uh, Chief Porter is using it. He's using it right now. And Bridgeport is benefiting big time behind community policing, uh, excuse me, not only behind community policing, but Comstat because they have less manpower, but their crime is way down compared mm -hmm. to how it used to be. So Comstat is an absolutely useful tool. And I thank Chief Chapman for that. He, uh, he knew his stuff. He did. He knew his stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's still around. I think he does consulting now. And yes, that's the thing. You know, Ch Chief Anamone, uh, Lou Anamone, who's former NYPD chief of department, is a friend of mine. He's been on the show a couple times. And that was his whole thing. He's like, listen, if there's numbers that are up in a certain area, I'm not going to get mad at the commander for that. What I will get mad at is if he doesn't have a plan or she doesn't have a plan to combat it. That's where I'll get angry. But if numbers are up, OK, it happens. There's ebbs and flows with crime. Do you have a plan? And if the answer is yes, we got no problems. And nine times out of 10 guys did because really the way Maple started, it, I think it was darts on a board when he was with the transit police back in, in the New York City in the late 80s, early 90s. Darts on a board and they would identify high crime areas in the New York City subway. They computerized it. Same thing in Bridgeport. Only thing yeah. with me, because I was in the office <clears throat> running the unit with another sergeant, it was just me and this other sergeant. We would just plot out because it was the projects. We were yeah. concentrating on the project. We knew we had a burglary problem in Trumbull Gardens. So we spotted it out and I already gave you the plan and, and it worked. And anything else we had, if we had, uh, we didn't have carjackers, not that much, but we had a lot of uh, burglaries. We had drug problems and drug problems. That was easy for us. We knew what to do with that. But uh, again, you had to have a plan. You can't just say, okay, well, crime is up here in uh, PT Barn. Yeah, well, what are you doing about it? And you better know what you're doing. Don't come up with some nonsense because Chief Chapman was no joke. He ruled. Uh, New York policing is different from yeah. anything else I've ever seen. You better have an answer, and that answer better be the right one. Luckily, I had all this street experience, so he, he you know, he loved me. At least that's what Captain Chapman said. I was like, look, I'm not going up. I'm a sergeant. You short? No, I don't want to go up there. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'll give you the answer. <laughs> so Captain Chapman took care of things for me, and he said Chief Chapman was very pleased with me. I'm like, great. That was good. Yeah, I gotta get I gotta get Chief Chapman on the show. Him and I are connected on LinkedIn. I gotta message him because he knows me uh, through the through this show, and I, I think he would be a good guest if we can get him. So that's definitely on the agenda. I'll ask you. You know, you love the street, and there's good and there's bad to that. There's guys, that, as we talked about with drug dealers, they love the street for the wrong reasons. If you're an active cop and you love the street, well, then you're gonna make a darn good cop. When you made lieutenant and you were in professional standards, a little bit of that went away because although that's important, as we just talked about earlier, we'll expand on it here. You're not out on the street as much with the guys. So when you made Lieutenant and you were assigned there, did you miss it or did you feel as you were getting ready to maybe wind down your career that it was time to get off the street? When community policing ended, I didn't want to be a supervisor actually, uh, mm -hmm. but Lieutenant Dave Daniels taught me to be, you know, taking, he said, look, you're going to move up. You want to make a difference. So anyway, I, I took the test, became a sergeant, but community policing only lasted a certain amount of time. They ran out of money. I ended up going back to narcotics. I was happy over there. Yeah, you started. And Dave Daniels came to me again. He's like, come on, you got to take the lieutenant. He says, I don't want to be a lieutenant. I'm happy. But he was right. He said, someday you may want to be a chief. You got to, you got to. So I took the test. When I became lieutenant, they asked me, what would I like to do? And I'm like, okay, well, what's this all about? I says, look, you have, you have a lot of street smarts. You can pretty much go where you want to go. I says, okay, whatever the chief wants. The chief at the time was Chief Gaudet. He said, bring him upstairs. He can work up here. He can work on professional standards, make sure officers do what they're supposed to do, work on policy, uh, the drug uh, testing of the officers, those kind of things. So I learned a lot up there. I really did. And it it was rewarding. I still miss the streets. Every now and then I get a call, you know, from my informant, this, that. I'm, you know, I'm inside now. But I would pass the information on to people that I trust. Uh, it was a great learning experience. It prepared me to be a chief, uh, which I did later on. Um, I did a lot of good. I did made a lot of policies. I made a lot of changes through the chief's office. We addressed a lot of racial issues that, you know, that make those things 
be a little bit better. So it did, you know. The only thing that the union hated me about was the drug testing. True story, when they did the drug testing at the city of Bridgeport, the drug company that did the testing was in Shelton, Connecticut, and they would mail the list. And it used to be about 30 officers, and they would mail it to the police department, the list, the which is supposed to be randomly picked by the computer. And every time I went down to get that list, the letter was open. So the names were exposed. I'm like, I'm not getting anybody testing positive for drugs. Something's wrong here. So I went to Gregory and Howe, that was the company, and showed them, says, look, from now on, I'll pick up the list. The first month that I picked it up, bam, this one tested positive for drugs. This one tested positive for drugs. Somebody was passing the information who's on the list, but I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet. I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. But again, it was a learning experience. As a supervisor, you have to be on top of your game because your people are smart. They're, you know, they're not stupid. They've been on the job, you know, a while. And some of the veteran officers, they, you know. But anyway, um, as a supervisor, I learned to navigate through a lot of nonsense. Uh, when I did have to bring somebody up on charges, I was very reasonable about it. I wouldn't go and try to hammer them because they still got family. But at the same time, it depends on what you've done. Uh, a verbal warning, fine. Do I have to suspend you for a couple of weeks? Fine. But again, it was all recommendations to the chief because I was a lieutenant. I couldn't take the action directly. But uh, he respected my position. And I stayed there for a while until I shot them and told him I was going to be a chief in Massachusetts. <laughs> he was like, what? I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> but uh, I enjoyed it. I did. I did. It was a great learning experience, something that I could pass on to my students as well. Mm -hmm. And like with any job, there are standards, especially for a job where you are making decisions that could lead to someone living or dying. And you're carrying a firearm in the correlation of making those decisions on duty. You better be clean. Like, listen, we're, I say this jokingly. We're all a little goofy and a little crazy in the head sometimes, but not crazy enough to be under the influence of narcotics or alcohol or anything else that's going to impede uh, duty. One so of the toughest things I had to do in my career was, I won't say his name, but there was a police officer that got into a shootout that I was involved in, <clears throat> I tried to kill him. He was stabbing him in the chest with a knife Ooh. and I shot this guy. And when the lights came on, his vest had holes all in it. Luckily, he didn't get through the vest. And that particular officer was a tough hombre. I mean, one of the toughest police officers I've ever seen. And some years later, when I became a lieutenant, he tested positive for drugs. He was strung out like he wouldn't believe because I was like, why is he working inside? That's not the person that I know. I won't say his name, but I, I remember he was working inside all the time. He was in the rec room. I was like, that's not the person I know. This guy was you know, out there, but something happened to him at that shooting. I know something happened to him because he wasn't right after that. And so when he tested positive for drugs, he didn't want to admit it. And I called him up and I said, look, can I meet with you? He said, I can't talk to you. I said, look, it's going to be off the record. I just want to talk to you. And I went and I met with him. I just told him point blank. I said, look, I don't want to fire you, all right? Something happened to you. It must have happened that night when we got involved in that shooting. Don't do this. Don't. I have to do what I have to do. You should retire, all right? Because I don't think this is going to change anytime soon. And uh, he looked at me and said, thanks. You know, I said, look, I, I, I'm not warning you. I'm just telling you, I'm very good at what I do. Please, I love you. Get out of here. He, the union kept pushing him, pushing him to stay. He finally realized that I wasn't, you know, I, I couldn't do anything about it. I mean, come on. If I could have done anything for him, I would have. I know right. why he was drugs. He was involved with a shooting. He was completely messed up. But yeah. if you're that messed up, you can't be a police officer anymore. It wasn't about the drugs. You can't be a police officer anymore. Look at you. He retired. And he yeah. got his pension. Yeah, that's good. And, and it's honestly because you know what? And this is something a lot of departments across the board in any area of first response are uh, focusing on now, which is good. The PTSD aspect. You're seeing, are, are there fun days as a police officer, as an EMS provider, as a firefighter? Absolutely. There's a lot of hilarious stories. We've touched on them tonight. There's a lot of awful days, too, where you're seeing some of the worst of the worst. And it, it messes with you upstairs, you know. So if you're not on top of your game and department upper echelons are starting to realize this now, if we don't look after our guys and gals after they've had some bad calls, no matter where they're working, we can lose them. It won't be an overnight process, but we can eventually lose them. 
I end up going to a psychiatrist on five occasions. Every time you get into a shooting, you have to be evaluated. Uh, the last couple of shootings, I actually enjoyed going to a psychiatrist because I went to one of my own. And <laughs> it's funny. This guy was a Tuskegee Airman. So he old, old psychiatrist in Stratford, but he was a Tuskegee Airman. If you know anything about Tuskegee Airmen, you know the hell they went through. Mm -hmm. I went in there. We didn't talk about my shooting. We, we, we touched on it, but we talked about what he been through. I'm like, oh, my God. It was so amazing to talk to someone with such rich history. I mean, again, we talked about my shooting. I told him what happened. I told him what I did. He said, oh, Bailey, you're fine. And then he would tell me some, we start talking. I would see him for about four or five times afterwards to talk about his stuff. <laughs> but one of the things you have to do when you get involved with a shooting, you do have to be evaluated. You're supposed to go on light duty. They always figured me as, you know, all right, he's been down this road before, so he's okay. So when the doctor said I was clear to go back, they would just put me back, at, back in the street. Um, that shooting uh, I, I can't even say the address because then you'd be able to, some of those people might be to hear who that officer was that ended up on drugs. But that shooting that we were involved in, that bothered me. Um, when I shot this guy, I shot him in the back. I shot him in the back because I had no place else to shoot. The officer was up against the wall. He was screaming, help me, help me. The guy was stabbing him. And it looked like, because the lights were off and he had dropped his flashlight, so you saw the strobe light effect, and it looked like he was stabbing it in his chest. I couldn't get to him in time because I was on the stairway, so I pulled my gun, I fired two rounds, and I shot him in the back. But I shot him in the back because I had no place else to shoot, and this officer was screaming at the top of his lungs. The other officers over me, two of them were over me, they shot, and I had to duck because they're shooting right by my head. That's the situation we were in. And it bothered me because that guy is never going to walk again. I thank God that he's still alive. I mean, I actually called the hospital. They asked me in court, what did you do after the shooting? He said, I called the hospital. You mean you called the, I called the check on him because I didn't want him to die. Well, he's not going to walk anymore. I didn't want him to die. Don't don't push it. The amazing thing about the shooting is we're God was good. When the lights came on, there were holes in the door. I didn't know it was a door. I thought it was a wall because the hallway was dark. There were kids on the other side of that door. Mm. So, and that kind of, it, it messed with you. That was the one shooting that kind of like really messed with me because I didn't want to shoot him. I didn't want him not to walk again. I didn't want, I didn't want any of this, but you were killing a cop. And like I said, I thought he had stabbed him to death. And then when the lights came on, I saw all the holes in his vest. I didn't, I completely forgot about the vest. I just completely forgot. So, but anyway. Understa understandably understandably, I mean, you got to take action in a situation like that because it's been, as has been covered before in all of my police interviews, it doesn't matter where you work. The common theme is this, unless you're a little off upstairs, no police officer gets into the job saying, wow, I really want to shoot someone today. That would be great. No, you prefer the guy put the knife down. He obeys your commands and you're able to take him into custody. And that's that, you know, then you let the court deal with him. You don't want to pull your piece out. And if you do, you don't want to fire. You're absolutely right about that. Um, five shootings, and I'm like, I did not, I didn't want not one of them. I didn't need yeah. that. You know, I didn't, I didn't need that. I enjoyed working undercover. I enjoyed, you know, it was the cops and robbers game. You know, that that was right. fun. Shootings, you can have that nonsense. I mean, I'm glad I survived. I'm glad I didn't have to kill anyone. Um, I can't even say anything else with that. No, you know, it really bothered me that that man's not going to walk anymore, but. I had no choice, none. No. And then what happened to that officer? He couldn't complete his career. He had to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a, an effect that takes a lifetime to unravel. And that's why it's so important that these departments, no matter where they be, police, fire, whatever it is, after a bad call, focus on it. Therapy, getting okay. them into at all the programs needed because that PTSD is no joke. So yep. it's good to have outlets and good to have a record line that recognizes the importance of that. Get into your time as a chief in Holyoke, Massachusetts. This it's one thing to go into a police department that's already up and running, has a little bit of history to it, and you can just gradually acclimate. This was literally an entirely new force that was being put together. It was Holyoke Community College. There's mm -hmm. a college up there, and they had a police force. They had retired state troopers. And when I got there, 
I was a little surprised they didn't have guns. They didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what is this all about? Because I've been, you know, I've had a gun my whole 30 years at the police department, you know, and they said, well, they hadn't passed anything yet. And true story, I'm up there figuring, how can I convince these people that the college has to be armed because it's more dangerous here than anywhere else because people know they're not armed. And this is a, a community here. we got to protect this community. And there's a woman. I get a call. There's a woman. She's on campus, and she's headed towards the main office with a rifle case, a rifle case. And I'm like, oh, my God. I'm running towards the office with two of my officers to take on a woman with a rifle. Luckily, it wasn't, it was a prop. It was an actress taking oh. her. I'm like, why didn't the professor of arts call me? I'm like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, I'm peeing in my pants because I'm going on a call for the first time in my career with nothing but my hands. I'm like, how am I gonna handle this, Lord? <laughs> so when I went to my boss about it, I said, look, this is ridiculous. I can't stay here if we're gonna, oh, we'll talk to, no, we'll talk to the board, get the approval. I'll get these guys armed. I'll pick the right weapon. I'll get the right grainage for the bullet that we're gonna carry. It's gonna be the same one that match the whole police department because I've been down to talk to the chief down there. We'll get the psychiatric evaluation. I know how to do this. Let me do this. Within four months, every single officer up there was armed. They were hugging me and kissing me. I'm like, get off of me. <laughs> but they were so happy. They were retired cops. I'm like, didn't any of you guys think to tell them about this? But it was that one incident that sold them on, okay, these officers need to be armed. Every last one of them up there is armed. And I left them that way. I only stayed there two years. I got tired. I mean, I lived down in the Ansonia Valley area. That's mm -hmm. a three-hour drive up and a three-hour drive. Oh, yeah. Man, it'll be tough day. on you. And on weekends, if there's an emergency, I got to come. Okay, that, 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 that's enough. So after that, I just, I just, I teach now. You know, I teach. Mm -hmm. Plus, you know, my son passed away, so that that was something. I'm else. sorry. Yeah, uh, he died in a motorcycle accident, and um, that happened eight years ago. And by that time, it's like, okay, it's time for me to stop. He had a three-year-old daughter at the time. She's not here tonight, actually. She's at her aunt's, and uh, the mother couldn't take care of her, and so I adopted her. She's now my daughter. She's 11 now. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, we talk about police stuff, me and her, because she sees the uh, the pictures and stuff around. And she's like, Daddy. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's go to school. Learn. <laughs> You're not going to be a cop. over my dead body. And tell your boyfriend I got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, does she have any interests and aspirations in her own right? She uh, want to do it? We have several dogs here in the house. And mm. it's just me and her. And she wants to be a veterinarian. She's this okay. about it. She loves dogs. She loves animals. And I think she's going to be one because she's been talking about college. Uh, I've taken to the college where I teach. So she sees what that's all about. And uh, she's really interested in being a veterinarian. I was like, honey, anything you want to do that's legal, we can do it. So <laughs> you go. I go to church every Sunday and uh, she enjoys church. too. I, I, I couldn't be more happier. Uh, every now and then she uh, she makes fun of me. You don't look like a mom. Yeah, well. Get over it. <laughs> I have a picture of me in the dress, but we won't show that. I actually, I wore a dress. <laughs> I bought a dress and bought a wig just as a joke because one of the kids that picked that and said, oh, you don't have no mom. You know, every time we come, there's just your dad. So I have a picture of me. I'll send it to you later. Me in the dress with my wig. So she came, she got off the bus and she, she's looking like, it's me, dad. <laughs> So that, are you crazy? But it was just as a joke, just to make her laugh. You know, correct. Right. Like I, I, I think that mom thing bothers, but not anymore. <laughs> right. Hey, listen, as long as you have good structure and guidance, I, I get it. I grew up without a dad, but I got my mom here who played both roles. Uh, <laughs> you know, one played one them. I knew yes. she wasn't going to let you kiss down. No, 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 she is not. You know, <laughs> I used to, <laughs> no, I always used to joke and I was never a kid to be out in the street anyway, but I always used to joke. I'm like, if I ever, for whatever reason, get in trouble with the cops, cause she knew and was friendly and still was friendly with a lot of new Haven cops. I'm like, don't even bring me home. I'll take me straight to jail. I don't need a lawyer. I don't need a trial. Bring me straight to jail. I'm not trying to go. <laughs> uh, she yeah. did a good job. She really did. Oh, thank you.
Thank you. Love her. I know she's watching tonight. She's not in the chat, but she said she would be watching. So oh, hi, good. mom. And uh, now it is time for the rapid fire segment, which is five hit and run questions from me, five hit and run answers from you. You could say pass if you want. They're not hard questions. They're lighthearted in nature. And this first one, you could say multiple if you want. It doesn't have to be one call. Like we said earlier, a lot of tough calls in policing, a lot of funny ones too. What is one of the funniest ones you'd say you've ever been on? One of the funniest ones? Mm -hmm. Ooh. I went on a call and the guy had drugs and ran into the apartment, and I, into an empty apartment. I ran up there to get him and I got the drugs from him and I got the money from him and I handcuffed him. And he said he was going to, I had a wife at the time. He said, so well, I'm going to kill your wife. And he knew my wife, my ex-wife. And I was livid because he knew, he knew me and he knew my wife. And I, 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 had, I remember having the money in the hand and I tripped. And when I tripped, the money went out the window and all the kids down at the bottom, <laughs> you know what happened. And he was yelling, screaming, ah, ah, ah. I said, I tripped, I tripped. What do you want from me? Why didn't you drop the drugs? The funny thing is when we got down there, not one dollar was there. And the next day, all of the kids had ice cream, candy. <laughs> but that would be the funniest one if I had to think of something funny. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> I got to wonder note. if I really tripped on purpose or, or, or it really was a trip, but we won't go there. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave that ambiguous for the audience and decide for themselves. And second, this is another one you could say multiple because I know many will probably come to mind. Most uplifting call you ever responded to? Most uplifting call, I went to a call. There was a black officer, me. There was a white officer and a Latino. The Latino officer and the white officer got there before I did. The woman was standing on the corner and she was acting crazy in their opinion. And when I got there, she was running and place and yelling and screaming. Oh, God, you love another. She was going nuts, right? And they were about to arrest her. And if you know the culture, you won't do that. I said, like, don't arrest her. What do you mean, baby? She's crazy. She's, she's, she's look at her. She's screaming and hollering. She's yelling about Satan. I said, look, don't arrest her. Leave her alone. She's not crazy. She's tarrying. She's praising God. It's a Pentecostal thing. And when I said that, she turned and looked at me, praise him. Thank you, Jesus. And she ran off. True story. Yep. <laughs> you're, you're right about that. I know. You're right. I don't believe it either. Are you going to arrest a church woman? Really? But yeah. it worked yeah. out. That's where that's where that officer discretion comes into play. Yeah. Third, and I'm sure you got a lot of advice early on, as you talked about throughout the show. Best advice anyone ever gave you? Document everything and don't trust the police department on anything mm. not 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 as far as as, as being crooked or anything let's just document everything for your own well-being right. uh keep records everything i did which is the reason why i wrote the book because i had everything this officer told me keep everything and i did i documented everything i kept my files i kept everything and true story when this discrimination thing was going on between me and the chief my complete folder and file for umpteen years ended up disappearing. They lost it. I'm the only officer in the city of Bridgeport where you couldn't find the file. Guess what? I brought everything in and they had to put it exactly. That officer was Officer Ted Meekins who at first talked me into being a police officer. He's the one that said keep everything, copies of everything. And I was able to rebuild my file to the dislike of many there at the upstairs. Uh, but uh, that was the best advice. Oh, and, and to be kind to everyone. Treat mm -hmm. everybody like you would want people to treat you and your family. And that Man. came from our white officer, Officer Dave John Drill. Mm -hmm. Those were the two best pieces of advice. Fourth, favorite cop show or cop movie? Ooh. I kind of like Miami Vice. That was pretty good. That reminded me a lot of some of the things I was doing. Of course, I didn't drive a Mercedes because <laughs> we had you no. Know, we had Mercedes and we had BMW, but I took the, the Honda and the beat up car because those cars attract attention. I didn't want attention, but uh, that that was my favorite. Miami Vice. I kind of like the Bad Boys too. Yeah, <laughs> there were some true. things I did with those. Those I'm like, oh my god. But that those two. 
Yeah, those were good. Those were good. They're making a new Bad Boys right now as we speak. It's about to be released, I think, in the summertime. And what fifth are you, and in the What the hell? Yeah, <laughs> I'm about to say. They're a little up there now. Will Smith is in pretty good shape. Martin Lawrence, though, yeah, it might be a bit of a challenge for I'm him. I'm only joking. I'm sure they'll fix it. They'll fix it. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they will, too. I'm looking forward to it. And fifth and finally, let's say you could just grab a new officer fresh out of the academy, not only in Bridgeport, but anywhere. Given your 33 years between Holyoke and Bridgeport of experience, what advice would you give a rookie cop now? I would give him the same advice that I was given from Dave John Drill, Sergeant John Drill. Treat everybody like you would want people to treat your family. You're going to be fine. Be kind. Be fair. Keep your guard up at all times. But don't forget to be kind to people. That goes a long way. And I always gave the example. Whenever you walk to a car, you have your hand on your gun because that's what you're trained to do because you don't know the people in the car. Once you're finished addressing whatever issues in the car, apologize to them. Because they're looking at you and you got your hand on your gun. They don't know why. So, look, I'm going to apologize to you. I want you to understand that's part of my training. I don't know you. You didn't know me. And I need to go home safe. And that's the only reason I have my hand on my gun. I don't ever want you to feel like you're threatened or anything. That was just a part of my training. And you have a blessed day. I always say that to my students. I say it to any police officer that, that, that I knew that asked me about this. That's what I tell them to think and to do. There you go. Sound advice. Sound advice. Leave them with a good taste in their mouth and at least they can Absolutely. understand. Goes off a long way. And those same people that you treat good, it will come back to you. They'll mm -hmm. be out for you. Mm -hmm. When they sure did during your career. I, I knew this was going to be fun. Like I said, I'm so glad I asked mom, like I said at the top of the show, do you think he'll do it? And he did. And he delivered tonight, folks. So before I say goodbye to the audience, stick around because you, me, and producer Rick are going to talk off air briefly. Okay. Uh, is, there, is there any shout outs to anyone or anything that you'd like to give? Um, no. Uh, Bridgeport Police Department, keep up the good work. Chief Porter, you got it. You know what you're doing. Superintendent Higgins, so proud of you. You're now the head of the state police. God bless you. Uh, everybody out there, stay safe. Be kind to everybody. Just like I was, you do the same. Mm -hmm. All there work you go. out. It'll all work out. Shout out to everybody who tuned in in the audience tonight across YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and those of you that will watch this later or listen to it later on the audio side. Uh, always great to have the support of the audience. Coming up next on the Mike Denuave podcast, finished up as the FDNY chief of department. And he had also an extensive 40-year run in the FDNY, was chief of department, I believe, from 2010 until 2014. So I want to profile him. I've been trying to get him for a while. Finally did. That's Chief Ed Kilduff. He'll be here for another volume of the best, the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. And Friday, I'm trying to figure out who we're going to have. Oh, actually, is so it's going to be a different start time. Usually we start at 7. I have an obligation that day. Uh, it's going to be David Burns. It'll be at 8.30. So take a note of that in the audience. 8.30 start time next Friday. David Burns. Longtime EMS uh, supervisor in New York City, also a former photographer, the New York Daily News and New York Post. So we caught a lot of interesting police and fire scenes over the years. So he'll be here uh, to share his stories, both as a responder and photographing first responders. That's next Friday again, not 7, 830 p.m., different start time than usual. In the meantime, this has been Volume 11, the beat profiles of police nationwide. And on behalf of retired chief Ron Bailey and producer Victor, who always does a great job. I'm Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Have a great weekend, everybody. Go Knicks, go Rangers.